draft game. All right. Now, were you going to sing a theme song for the draft game, Joey? No, it's, uh, you know, the old uh, Sega imprints. Or it goes, Sega. Yeah, I remember that. Draft game. <laughs> I remember that from the Sonic the Hedgehog games and Golden Axe and stuff. I remember the Sega intro. That's good stuff. Yeah, and so you can go, draft game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. What were you going to say, Kerm? Very good stat, Kerm. Only four other coaches was it has been has been Bear Bear Bryant, the Spurrier, Johnny Bond, and and Vince Dooley. Those are the only four SEC coaches to get one hundred conference wins. That's a pretty elite group. Yeah. All right, number one on my top fifty is USC quarterback Sam Darnold. Now, Darnold did well. He had his first game without a turnover on Saturday versus Utah, but at the same time, he had two fumbles lost early in that game before he bounced back and got everything together. So with nine interceptions and nine lost fumbles, Sam Darnold's draft stock is literally a time bomb at this point. He's still number one for now, but barely. And the moment he makes another mistake... Or if he loses to someone like Josh Rosen, heads up. The moment he does something like that, he's no longer number one. But right now, he's barely hanging on to that number one spot by a thread. And if you want a quarterback with the best intangibles in this draft, you need to take Baker Mayfield. But if you want a guy with the arm, probably the best durability, best size, but is a project from an intangible standpoint, but and has enough of a ceiling to develop into a pro bowler, this is the guy you want in Sam Darnold. And with Darnold, he doesn't want to go to the Jets or the Browns. I heard that if the Browns continue down this path and get the number one pick, he will return to school. So in a sense, I kind of do want the Browns to get the number one pick so he ultimately re comes to his senses and goes back to school. But the one team that has scouted him four times this year is the 49ers. And if they are picking at number one, they expect Darnold to declare and be the number one pick in the draft. So I'm going to click Sam Darnold on the draft game, and we'll move on to the next player. And that's Arden Key. Well, here's, here's the thing, Chris. I, I'm going to comment real quick on this situation. I've said for two years, maybe three years, that Mayfield was going to be the number one quarterback in this draft, and he's still showing that he would be the number one quarterback in this draft. So he's my top guy. But to your point, I believe it would be beneficial. So I'm torn between being a Brown fan and saying, hey, you know, the uh, Browns have said that the reason – they're starting their other quarterback this week is because the players are tired of losing and the players feel that instead of developing a guy the way they were going about it there, that they want a backup in, so they want to get some wins. So, but, so as a Browns fan, I like that the Browns are getting wins. But as a as an evaluator, I know that Darnold needs to go back. So I'm saying, as an evaluator, am I looking at this? Do I want the Browns to have the number one pick so Darnold goes back and develops more, goes to more of these off-season camps and gets his mechanics fixed better? Or, as a Browns fan, do I want the Browns to win to stay out of that spot? So, I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough game, but I... I'm saying it now, Josh Rosen will beat Sam Darnold head-to-head. -head. Rosen should end up, it's going to be Rosen and Mayfield for the number one player in this draft. Book it. Yeah, I, I can definitely see Rosen jumping Darnold. 
Uh, and we'll get to Rosen in a little bit here, but the number two player on the draft game is Arden Key. We mentioned him a little bit earlier when looking at Josh Allen of Kentucky. I have him going to the Bears, and this guy has not been as consistent as getting to the quarterback at last year, but the thing is, Arden Key missed a few games with an injury, so I think the Bears pick him up at number two, though. Number three, Mike McGlinchey, Notre Dame. Mike McGlinchey and Trey Adams are 1A and 1B. I, McGlinchey was my preseason number one offensive tackle. I moved Adams ahead of McGlinchey after the Georgia game, but McGlinchey has been money ever since that he allowed that game-winning sack for Georgia over Notre Dame. And Notre Dame played Georgia really well in that game. Like, they pushed Georgia to the limit. And we could, if McGlinchey doesn't give up that sack, we could easily be looking at Notre Dame at 6-0 and and Georgia at 5-1. and So McGlinchey has played very good since then. He pancaked Harold Landry, knocked him to the ground. So Notre Dame plays USC next week. So I'm curious to see what McGlinchey does versus Porter Gustin. But I have the Giants taking Mike McGlinchey at 3 there are some people who mock Josh Rosen and the Giants to become a pretty popular, trendy pick, but this is the thing. If you cut Eli Manning, you save $9.8 million, but you lose Justin Pugh, you lose Weston Richburg because those guys are not even going to entice the thought of re-signing with the New York Giants if you release Eli Manning. But Well, here's the, here's the thing about that, Chris, is that it all depends on one factor, and that's Webb as their backup. How well does he develop? Does he develop extremely well this year, they don't draft Rosen. If he does not develop, they draft Rosen. That's the linchpin that you have to look for, is to how does Webb develop behind Eli Manning. Because I see a career backup with Davis Webb in terms of development. But you're right, Joey. They That might be what it ultimately comes down to, because... The 2019-2020 QB classes look very pedestrian compared to this year's draft. And I know this year in high school football, there's a lot of senior quarterbacks. I have like 12 senior quarterbacks in my top 50 for high school rankings. So some of those guys start right away. 2021 could be the closest thing we have to a strong quarterback class when you compare the upcoming classes to 2018. So from an urgency standpoint, you can argue that it is paramount for the Giants to take a quarterback this year when you look at the window of opportunity for a franchise quarterback is not going to be there in the next two years. So let's just take That's one right. now. You have to realize that they took the pedestrian like Eli Manning in the first round and it turned out pretty well for him over the last 10 years or so. So, I mean, you got to look at it. Plus, if yeah. they went with a Rosen-type quarterback, it would be like Kurt Warner, Eli Manning all over again, except Eli would be in Warner's shoes, and if he screwed up enough, they'd eventually play a Rosen. Yeah, what are you going to say, Kurt? Yeah, I was traded to the Giants that had the Chargers pick him because he refused to play in San Diego. And I agree with you. Can I agree with you on the Giants drafting a quarterback this year? It all depends on, on how well the fact of the they develop. Because it is that he might like, is getting up there. I don't see too many more years how to how to be like that. Well, there's two approaches the Giants can take. They can either blow up their roster and go into a complete rebuild, or they can try to put together one more playoff team for Eli Manning by getting a new left tackle, re-signing their current starters in the offensive line, but doing this will cost you a chance to get a franchise quarterback or in the first round of the draft, and you are banking on Davis Webb if you do that. That's the thing. So, you're... Yeah, well, Chris, we spent enough time on this. You were going on about our key, so let's yeah. get back to it. Let's move on to number four, and that's the Saquon Barkley out of Penn State. He is the number four player on my draft game. He's also the only player with a 99 overall rating in the NCAA 14 roster updates for this season, but that's irrelevant because Saquon Barkley's just been running. His vision's better. His ability to block on passes is improved. And if I'm the Browns, I'm taking Barkley at four unless I get... But I'm going to tell teams, like, I'm going to troll the Dolphins. I'm going to troll the Bills. I'm going to prank call both of them. I'm going to say, listen, we're taking Josh Rosen at number four unless you make us a blockbuster offer but I'm going to be bluffing like John Lynch did when he trolled the Bears over Trubisky. 
That's going to be my mindset, my mentality. If Rosen's there at four, I'm going to troll the Dolphins. I'm going to troll the Bills and say, listen, we're taking Rosen unless you give us a hell of a deal. And I'm going to try to put both the Bills and the Dolphins in a bidding war for a quarterback just to keep the Jets from getting Josh Rosen. And I'm going to try to move down and accumulate more picks. And well, I'm going to see who makes me the better offer. And if I'm not satisfied with either offer, I'm going to want a first, a third, and a 2019 first-round pick. And if I get all that, I'll pull the trigger and move down a few spots. And if not, I won't. And I'll take Barkley at four. And then I'll trade the Houston pick because I think the Browns honestly have the luxury to trade both picks right now if they're picking in the top eight twice. But if I'm at four and Barkley is there, I'm going to troll the teams that need quarterbacks into moving up for one and getting another first round pick. I think there's a strategy uh, to this. That's not trolling, Chris. That's having a bet. Yeah. That, it's that's it's four to him. Even if he a for one, hey, you want you want to take. Pay me pay me a nice event for me to let him pay down. Yeah, and I agree with Crum on that. And uh, I'll say that right now that this draft for, I think, I'm going to put it to you like this. If the Browns get the number one pick, uh, this draft you can get a Baker Mayfield or a Josh Rosen later down the line. So you can get an extra first, second, or third by trading the number one overall pick. But here's the thing with that, because I don't think that the best player on the board is a quarterback. Right now, I'm not sure who the consensus number one player would be. So, if the Browns get the number one, they could trade back. This class is a pretty good class for running back at the top half of the draft. It's a pretty good class for wide receiver at the top half of the draft, where you can get a playmaker. Uh, it's so the top half of the draft, you could trade back and still get a player, and in the Browns' case, a player you need. You could still get that running back, and I would love to see Barkley as a Brown because the other running backs just aren't getting it done. Uh, so, and Barkley is a complete player, and something that amazes me is he is a pretty good pass blocker, and. That's, for a top four prospect, that is damn difficult to come by at running back is it being a good pass blocker. Yeah, and that's the thing. Ezekiel Elliott was a good rate block, pass blocker. He had a 4 4 3 40 time. Barkley's projected to run in the 4 threes. He's faster than Elliott, but he wasn't as consistent in pass protection until this season. So he finally fixed that area of his game, and now he's the top overall prospect. My only blue chip graded prospect at the moment but I'm going through doing a lot of research on these players, and I think the Browns have to leverage that. If they're picking at number one, they got to see who's gullible enough to give up a 2019 first as well as their first this year and a third in this year's draft as well. You don't have to demand three number one picks like the Rams did. You're not going to get that, but I think you at least have to get a one this year and a one next year if you want to trade the first pick. Now, if you want to trade the second pick, I don't think they will. If they trade the first pick, I think they'll take Barkley with uh, one of their second picks, depending on where they're picking, if he falls to that point in the top ten. But, yeah, the Browns have some things. Number five on the board is Josh Rosen. We spent a little bit of time talking about him as a possible fit for the New York Giants. He had zero touchdowns, two interceptions against the Arizona Wildcats last night in a difficult loss. That's not a game that's going to hinder his stock, but it is a game that's going to it's going to make you ask yourself should Baker Mayfield be ahead of Josh Rosen. I I it's just this was a very disappointing outing by Rosen. I still think teams are high on him mainly because of what he did versus Texas A&M, but this game Arizona doesn't have that many NFL prospects this year. So this is a game where it's sort of you're sort of wondering well, Rosen is a guy who has all the mechanics. He's good mechanically. He's a guy that has 
a good head on his shoulders. He's fiery. He's a strong leader. He's got all this going for him, but he has decision-making issues. Uh, this is something that one of the people uh, who are arguing with me about prospects said, well, um, these prospects when I was arguing with Sam Darnold they were right. He's like, oh, look at the arm strength. Look at the leadership. Look at the clutch play. Look at all this other stuff. And I'm like, there are like five quarterbacks in this draft with all these things you just mentioned. You had to pick the guy that is standing out. And right now that is Baker Mayfield. And the reason Baker Mayfield is standing out is because he has the accuracy. He has the decision-making to go with all these other traits that he has. He has the mobility. And that's the thing that we want to see from Rosen, is that Rosen does not have the field vision and he does not have the accuracy. Those are his two knocks. And that's what Mayfield has. That's what put Mayfield at the top of the board where the other quarterbacks are down. And so that was the argument that he was naming off all these things that Darnold had. I'm like, there are five other quarterbacks with these things. Name me something Darnold has that Mayfield doesn't have, that Rosen doesn't have. So Rosen has to improve his accuracy and his field vision. And if he does that, I think he could be in the running for the number one pick. Absolutely. I have Rosen going to the New York Jets at number five. But moving on, um, the number six player on our draft game is Derwin James out of Florida State. I think he's the top safety in the country, 6'3", 211. The only mistake I saw James make on tape this year was a whiff tackle versus NC State. That resulted in a touchdown. But other than that, he's been absolutely phenomenal on tape this year, and I have the Chargers getting Derwin James at number six. Number seven player in my uh, draft game is Quentin Nelson out of Notre Dame. I have the Dolphins taking him at seven. Another good fit would be the Indianapolis Colts because their left guard, Jack Muhort, who's in a contract year, just got placed on injured reserve. So that is big news for the Colts because their offensive line will not be at 100% even with luck back, and they might have to do some tweaking. But Quentin Nelson just seems like the complete guard prospect, and a team like the Dolphins or the Colts or any one of those teams, even the Giants, if they lost Justin Pugh, and they got a QB in free agency, or if they were confident with Eli, even they could be in the market. But that I don't think the Giants go Nelson. I think they go offensive tackle or quarterback. All right, moving on to number eight, we have another player at safety, Ronnie Harrison out of Alabama. I, I love this guy on tape. He has everything you want in a complete safety, and Ronnie Harrison, I have the Browns taking him with the Texans pick to pair up with Jabril Peppers. But I honestly think the Browns are going to trade one of the two picks. I, I honestly believe that, but I don't predict trades in my mock draft. So he's just he's the best player on the board. We're just going to leave him on the Browns with Barkley, and we're going to see how this goes because I, I feel like the Browns are trading one of these two picks. They might even trade both of them. It depends because if the Browns took 7-71 seven and 71 from the Dolphins, they could still get Saquon Barkley at 7 after trading – from down from four to seven, and they could still and they could trade down again eight. But I think they will trade back up in the late first round. I think there's some sort of because all because there's going to be a receiver run later in the draft, which we'll get to later in the draft game. But Ronnie Harrison to the Browns at eight, number nine. We'll go back to offensive tackle Trey Adams out of Washington. The Bengals they need a left tackle. Trey Adams is number nine on my draft game. He's one B behind Mike McGlinchey as the top offensive tackle in the draft. McGlinchey does a better job maintaining blocks, which is my number one thing I look for in an offensive lineman, but Trey Adams is the better wingspan and the better foot speed. So with Washington losing their first game, I'm kind of curious to see how Adams did on tape this week. Did he miss some blocks? Did he miss some assignments? I'm sort of curious to see how that plays out. So Trey Adams at number nine, and at number 10, I have the Arizona Cardinals taking your guy, your number one guy who I gave a max grade for for learning rate and intangibles, and that's Baker Mayfield. So Baker Mayfield's also the highest rated quarterback on NCAA 14. But Baker Mayfield, there's a reason this guy's being talked about. I know some people in the draft community say he's a pure college QB. He plays in a spread offense. His skills won't translate. Well, they're wrong. He went 202 pass attempts without interception. He finally threw his first pick versus Texas yesterday, 
but he displayed incredible leadership, still threw over 300 yards, and just really has a lot of the things you want in a quarterback. So, Baker Mayfield. Well, here's the thing about Baker. You look at him, and you say all these things. It's easier to stand on the surface. Um, something I did with Nick Foles that helped my evaluation with him. They said the same thing about him. He's a check-down quarterback. When he does these things you say that he should not do, what does he do with it? When he takes a snap under center, what does he do? Does he throw an interception? Does he get rattled? Does he fumble the ball? What's he do? Uh, when he has an out route, does he throw it too wide? Does he throw it out of bounds? When he runs a route that is not exactly in the spread route tree, what's he do with it? I compiled a... I went back and I watched every tape of Nick Foles. I compiled a list of everything he did that was not a check down. And then my evaluation of Nick Foles was correct. Unfortunately, Nick Foles came on some hard times in the pros. You know, a lot of it had to do with coaching. We can't predict that, nor do we care to. That's not our job, Chris. But what we can do is look at these different things, and that's what you have to do with Mayfield. You have to look, you say, he doesn't do that. Okay, so what do you do when he does do this? And his completion percentage shows... And he does a pretty good job when he does these things. Um, when he throws those routes, he does a pretty good job when he uh, gets under center. He doesn't fumble. He doesn't do anything stupid. So these are things you have to look at when evaluating. When you try to make these arguments, you better come up with a good argument because if it can be refuted, then your argument is null and void. Yeah, it's like Baker Mayfield, the accuracy is there, the precision is there, the intangibles are there. The only questions about him are the height, and I feel like he has a good arm, but not a great arm. But those are the only things with Baker, and I think a lot of scouts are like, I want big hands, I want an elite arm, I, I want the accuracy, I want all of this. There isn't a quarterback like that, there hasn't been since Luck, who's had all of those things heading into the NFL. Goff had the accuracy, but he didn't have the arm or the uh, hand size, which was your biggest thing with him. Wentz had all of those things, and he dominated the senior bowl, even if his tape doesn't indicate otherwise. So, yeah, you're not going to get a Wentz or a Luck. Here's the thing that I... This is why I compare him to Drew Brees. And I don't make many comparisons. Is the size is comparable... The arm strength is better. The accuracy is comparable. The way he scans the field and views the field is comparable. The leadership is comparable. The mobility back when he was younger is comparable. So that's what you have to look at. Is you know all these things are comparable to Drew Brees. So what's wrong with having another Drew Brees? I, I don't see the issue with that if a team drafts a Drew Brees. It's, Neither and, do I. But some scouts are comparing Baker to Johnny Manziel more so than Drew Brees. And I think that's a huge flaw in their talent evaluations and their write-ups. Um, number 11, moving on, cornerback slash safety Minka Fitzpatrick out of Alabama. And this is a player that I have going to the Bills to pair with Davis White. He's also on the Heisman ballot at the moment. He was... Fourth on the Heisman heading into this week, so I'm just a little bit curious. And quick question, Kerm. Do you like Minka or Ronnie Harrison better of the two Alabama defensive backs this year? Personally, I like Minka better, but only by a little bit. It's going to come down, I believe, on drafting them. Just got to with team these the respective position first. Because Minka is first to he can play, he can play a lot of different quarter positions, but if the team needs a safety first and they come up first, I think I think I think Hillman will be drafted ahead of Minka. You mean but if a team needs a safety first, then Ronnie Harrison would go ahead of Minka? Yeah, but if they need a quarter, if they need a DB first, Minka's going to go going to go first. 
And the Browns need both a second safety next to Peppers and a corner. So that makes the Browns at eight with the Texans pick the team that's probably going to take one of the Bama players, but we don't know which one they take yet. It's extremely difficult to project at this point. But I've got the Bills taking Minka because they need another corner with White. If I was the GM, I would I would select Minka first. Interesting. I I actually considered moving Minka ahead of Ronnie Harrison in the draft game this week, depending on what the projected records are, if they're the same or whatever. So that's interesting. Projecting for, on what uh, Kerm says. Project. He's Kerm. Yes. Moving on, our number one receiver, James Washington. Finally, he's number 12 on the board. I have the Jaguars taking him at number 12. Like Joey had last week, he had the Jaguars taking James Washington at 13 or something. But I have James Washington and the Jaguars at 12. Go ahead, Jaguars fans. Insert the Justin Blackman jokes. They took him out of Oklahoma State a few years ago as well. So James Washington. Alan Richard, Alan Robinson's in a contract year. So, Robinson is going to be a free agent after this year. I don't think they re-sign him. So, I, I think James Washington goes to the Jaguars. If the Jaguars keep winning games, as long as the Jaguars win eight games, they're not taking a quarterback to replace Blake Bortles. Right now, they're at three wins. So, yeah. Well, here's the thing about Washington. I love Washington's speed. I have questions about Washington's route running. Uh, and I'm not... Sold one hundred percent on his uh, on his red zone. That's why I have him as my rotating between my number two and number three receiver with Auden Tate, which doesn't have the who a guy who don't does not have those questions. Um, so, I mean. There is no questioning his ability, but you do have to ask some questions about a few of these key uh, situational skills that he has. And so that is the one thing that's keeping me from throwing him up into my number one receiver spot is he has more questions and some of these other prospects do about key situational skills. Yeah, like the route running for Anthony Miller, Anthony Johnson, and Christian Kirk is at an elite level. These guys can run anywhere between 20 and 25 different routes. With James Washington, you're sort of looking at 12 to 15 effective routes that this guy can run. It's good, but you want to see more from him. That's sort of what I saw with Portland Sutton's route running as well. It's good, but you want to see more. That's sort of where I am with James Washington, even though he's great. If you're draft, if you have a vertical offense, this is the guy you want to take. It depends on the oh, offense absolutely. you run. If you're if you're running a vertical offense, you want James Washington. If you're running a West Coast offense or any type of variation that has a West Coast meaning, you would want Alden Tate. So Alden Tate. So you know that's why I've got him at one A and one B because you know. If you want a guy that's going to get downfield and just get after it, then Washington's the guy you want. Yep. Number 13, the Baltimore Ravens. They get the 100-yard rushing man from Stanford, Bryce Love. Bryce Love has better speed and vision than McCaffrey, but he's only 5'10", and he's not the pass catcher or blocker that McCaffrey is. But with the way he, how consistent Bryce Love has been this year, he might go in the first round, so... Bryce Love to the Ravens. I know it's not the best pick. I know there's some Ravens fans who are going to be chaining, we want Geis, we want Geis. Well, you got stuck with Bryce Love. Deal with it. We're moving on to number 14, which was a coin toss. The Lions and the Rams have the best. The Lions and Rams both went 8-8, eight and eight, and they both have the exact same strength of schedule. So I had to flip a coin. I asked a Rams fan, heads or tails? He went with tails. It was heads. So that's how the Lions got the number 14 pick. And with this pick, they took Christian Wilkins out of Clemson. They need a defensive lineman, and Christian Wilkins just seems like the complete blue chip player. One other guy to watch, though, who's not in my top 50 that I may move up next week is Derek Nottie out of Florida State. He has 10 tackles for a loss in six sacks in four games, which is just 
absolutely phenomenal for Florida State's defensive tackle. So what, he might move up ahead of Wilkins, but right now I have Wilkins as the number one defensive t- lineman in terms of defensive tackle for the draft because I think he brings a lot to the table as a three-down defensive tackle. And Nadi's a player I considered moving up, but I wasn't aware that he was doing that well until I got to the third round of my mock draft. So I am just mentioned Derek and Nadi really quickly. Um, but Christian Wilkins to the Lions at 14. Number 15, Chakwuma Okorafor. The Rams need a right tackle. They get Okorafor to pair with um, Andrew Whitworth, and Okorafor can become Goff's blind side down the road. So this pick makes a lot of logistical sense for the Rams here at 15, with Okorafor being on the board. Um, moving on to number 16, on their draft game. The Vikings are projected to pick at 16 at the moment at 8-8. Eight and eight. They're getting a quarterback. With how inconsistent their quarterback situation's been, Sam Bradford getting injured, then benched, with Teddy Bridgewater not playing yet, and Case Keenum doing terrible at first, but then doing a lot better. after He's, he's done much better since the Steeler game, but I still think the Vikings are taking a quarterback. Unless the Vikings make the playoffs... They're taking a quarterback, and even if they made the playoffs, I still think they would take a quarterback. And the quarterback they've looked at the most is Mason Rudolph. They actually sent their scouts to the Pitt Panthers game because that happened the day before. The Oklahoma State Pitt game happened the day before Minnesota faced the Steelers at Heinz Field. So they sent their scouts to that game, and they came away really impressed with Mason Rudolph. So Mason Rudolph to the Vikings, they get him here and they make him their franchise quarterback. I don't think they would go Lamar Jackson after this whole Teddy Bridgewater experiment, so I just feel like Mason Rudolph, they've also looked at Luke Falk out of Washington State. They're not going to be in position to get Sam Darnold. They went to the Washington State-USC game, and I don't think the Vikings want Luke Falk after that five-interception outing versus Cal, so Mason Rudolph to the Vikings just seems like the most logistical pick for Minnesota to make it 16. And moving on here, number 17, the Denver Broncos. Archie Lewis, I was going to move this guy out of the first round, but he I thought he got benched. He wasn't benched. He was injured the first two games. That's why he's still in this round one conversation. And they've moved him over to right tackle, which could be his natural position in the NFL if a team like the Denver Broncos takes him to pair with Garrett Bowles. He can play all five spots on the offensive line. And I, I really do like Archie Lewis on tape. He's great at maintaining blocks. Um, number 18, the Saints, they go Clellan Farrell here out of Clemson, and they get him to pair with um, Cameron Jordan. So they need they need someone. They also need a defensive tackle. Nick Fairley's got a career-ending injury, and Sheldon Rankins only has one. He only has two tackles on the year. No t- tackles for a loss, no sacks. That's very underwhelming for your 2016 first-round pick. So they are going to go defensive line. Whether they get a defensive end that can play off the edge next to Jordan or a defensive tackle remains to be seen. But the Saints, Saints are going to be looking at the defensive line here at 18. Number 19, the Dallas Cowboys. You're going to love this pick, Kerm. Bradley Chubb out of North Carolina State. This guy has just been dominating all year on tape, and he just feels like a great fit for the Cowboys Taco Charlton could be ready in a year from now, but with Bradley Chubb has just got a chance to be a Miles Garrett type of player. He's commanded triple teams at times on tape. He's lined up at all four positions on the defensive line. So I just think Bradley Chubb is that good. And Bradley Chubb, if a 4-3 team like the Lions, Lions don't re-sign Ziggy Ansah, Bradley Chubb could easily go higher than 19, but we have him at 19 on the draft game at this point. Clellan Farrell returns to school. Chubb will go to the Saints at 18. But my point is Bradley Chubb is going to be a top 20 pick, and he possibly could surge into the top 10. But he's a 43-only defensive end. That limits the scheme you can utilize him in, and that limits his draft range in mock drafts unless a 34 team reaches for him, which could still possibly happen. But Bradley Chubb's a top 20 talent. Moving on to number 20, uh, Anthony Miller out of Memphis. This guy, we've talked about him at the beginning of the show with Anthony Johnson. This guy's a top 20 talent. I have the Panthers taking him at number 20. And Cam Newton, he needs more reliable weapons. And, yeah, that's the top 20. We'll go through any thoughts on this top 20 really quickly before we get to the 21 through uh, 30, Joey? 
or do you want to just save your thoughts for after we get through the top 32 and then we'll quickly read through the rest of the players? Well, uh, the big thing, two big things right now. Two guys, I think, that are going to move up your board and both end up being top five guys are Baker Mayfield and Bradley Chubb. Mayfield has been pretty much dominant for three years. Chubb's been pretty dominant for two years. I think these two guys could potentially both end up being top five selections. Number 21, Holton Hill out of Texas. This guy plays cornerback and safety. He's 6'3", 200 pounds, and... Baker Mayfield was throwing away from him. He recognized where Holton Hill was. He didn't throw Holton Hill's way once the entire game, which is a huge plus because Darnold threw the ball near Holton Hill, but he was trying to connect with his best receiver, Deontay Burnett, who got by Hill. So Holton Hill has some first-round talent with his versatility, with his speed, with his instincts. He's Mark told me about him at the beginning of the year, and I watched the tape. I'm impressed. He kept James Washington in check last year. So Holton Hill, for me, is my number two corner in the draft. Um, there's two linebackers from Alabama. There's Rashawn Evans, whose speed and athleticism just is amazing. I had um, I had the Titans getting Holton Hill at 21, but the Raiders, I gave them Rashawn Evans. Alabama's got two really good linebackers this year, though. Rashawn Evans, who has the speed, the athleticism, and then Sean Dion Hamilton. Sean Dion Hamilton put together these uh, come to Jesus meetings where they would just go over plays like tape. It would be a film session slash Bible study. And the first half is mainly a film session. Even when they won by 30 points, this guy still put together these film sessions where what did we do wrong? Where did we screw up? And it's like if Reuben Foster had that mentality, he would have been the number two pick in the draft, Joey. Let's not deny that because he had the talent. He just didn't have that mentality off the field. And that's the thing with uh, Sean Dion Hamilton is that he has that mentality, but he doesn't have the athleticism of Rashawn Evans. I like Evans better, even though Hamilton does have more tackles. I'm just curious, Kerm, which of those linebackers are you a bigger fan of? Because I think both have the ability to go in the first round. I'm a bigger fan of Rashawn Evans. Well, I do like Sean Dion Hamilton, I think. Evans just gives a little bit more. I would and, uh, agree with that. Uh, Entirely. Number 23, um, the next person on our draft game at number 23 is Orlando Brown out of Oklahoma. And this guy is a reliable left tackle. He makes a lot of sense for a team like Seattle at 23. And Orlando Brown just fits here for um, Oklahoma at this spot, I mean, Orlando Brown gives Seattle their blind side, so this is a great pickup for them. Number 24 player on our draft game here is Harold Landry, and Harold Landry fits what Tampa Bay wants to do. They might even use him as an outside linebacker, like Tony Mario said. They, He might be Vaughn Miller, Khalil Mack started out as outside linebackers, and if Tampa Bay were to take a Harold Landry-type player, that would probably be where he starts out, and Boston College... They got a 45-42 to 42 win over Louisville, so that was a big upset win. But, yeah, Harold Landry's definitely a first-rounder. He just needs to get stronger. 25, I gave the Colts Lorenzo Carter. I may change this pick to Josh Allen out of Kentucky next week, but I, ha I still have the Colts winning this division. As crazy as it sounds, Joey, I have the Colts winning the AFC South still at 9-7. and seven. Um, Moving on to number 26, Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, I gave them Lamar Jackson. Now, this is the one place where Lamar Jackson will absolutely be a draft steal. He's not going number one. I mean, the Niners are not looking at him. They're looking at Rosen. They're looking at Allen. They're looking at Darnold. Those are the three they, quarterbacks they've limited themselves to. So those are the guys that the 49ers have scouted. That They're not looking at Mayfield. They're not looking at Lamar Jackson. And Kyle Shanahan, he wants a QB that's going to fit his system. So Lamar Jackson, I don't know where he'll fall because there's a few teams in the market for QBs. You've got San Francisco, you've got the Jets, you've got Arizona, and then you've got the Vikings and the Steelers. You could The Browns could enter this market, the Dolphins could enter this market, the Jaguars could enter this market if Bortles 
continues to play inconsistent, but it, there's, it's so wide open right now. We really don't know what teams are going to be in the market for a QB, and that's why mocking Lamar Jackson this low is incredibly difficult because he is a top, he's a first round talent without a doubt, but we don't know what teams are going to be in the market for quarterbacks, and I feel like Pittsburgh cannot pass on this guy if he falls to them at 26, Joey. There's just too much to work with here if he's at this spot. Yeah, I agree. All right, moving on, we have Darius Geis at LSU. Um, and this is the Eagles' first-round pick. They get him as a running back to replace Blunt. And now we are on our wide receiver run. And Ryan has called into the show to join us, but we're on, we're, we're on the wide receiver run now because we have eight of our next nine picks are all wide receivers. So the wide receiver run is officially underway. Let's start with my number three target outside of uh, Anthony Miller and James Washington. I have Jake Wine Jake Winecki as my number three target. He is a better draft pick than Cortland Sutton. He did more versus TCU than Sutton did. Sutton had zero receiving yards and one reception against TCU. And I'm going to continue to bring that up because Sutton has to wow me at the combine. He has to not drop a single pass in the gauntlet drill. That's what he has to do in order to move up in the draft board. I'm not sure he's going to do that yet. I know what Jake Weinick he's going to give me, and he's my my number 28 player on my draft game, and I have the Packers taking him. And Lisa brought up the idea of the Packers taking a receiver, a big target, and I agree with that thought process entirely because, let's face it, their biggest target is Devontae Adams at 6'4". He's going to be in a contract year. And then next year, you're going to have Randall Cobb and Jory Nelson contract years. So the Aaron, the Packers are going to try to get a big target. And I think the players on her list are Auden Tate and Alan Lazard out of Iowa State. Those are the two receivers that she wants the Packers to get. And she thinks they'll probably go with Lazard over Tate in that situation because the Packers have usually stayed away from Florida State players. So given their track record and philosophy with the draft. They could also look at someone like Sutton. They could look at some of these other targets, but I'm not as high on Sutton as most people are. I still have a top 40 grade on him, but I'm not as high on him, and I'll explain why. Just uh, Number 29, I gave the Falcons Connor Williams. He just makes sense for what they want to do. Um, number 30, the Buffalo Bills, Calvin Ridley out of Alabama. He has first-round speed. He does not consistently produce like Amari Cooper did, but he has first-round speed, and that's why he'll get picked in the first round. I think he's more of a late first-round pick than a top-10 pick, but people love this guy. So, Kerm, what are your thoughts on Calvin Ridley? I think I would play him in the first round because if you look at a program that must have you say, you have to look at he is the leading a pass catcher on the Alabama team. That's a fair point. He belongs in the first round because of his speed, and he's gotten better as a pass catcher. He hasn't wowed you with these 100-yard games yet, but he's been pretty consistent. He outplayed Christian Kirk last week, so I think he does belong in the first round. I'm just not sure if he belongs in the top five or the top ten, but he does belong in the first round. Probably put him in the top five or ten, because there's definitely more people ahead of him. Now we're putting him as the number one receiver. I'm I have him as the number four receiver. I have um, Washington, Anthony Miller, Jake Winecki as my top three, and then Ridley at four. And then number five receiver, Auden Tate. Um, Florida State, tar big target. He makes a lot of sense there. I have the Bills taking Ridley and the Redskins taking Tate at 31. And then number 32, Christian Kirk. My preseason number one receiver, he falls to the Patriots. They get another Edelman with him, and it's just the way it, Patriots. Someone, this is what's going to happen with Christian Kirk, because Christian Kirk is the best tape of any receiver heading into this year. He's going to fall to a team like the Packers or the Patriots or even the Saints, some team with an elite quarterback, and they are going to get the steal of the draft. That's how this is going to go down. 
I mean, I don't think Kirk's going to be the first receiver taken, but if he goes to a team with the Hall of Fame quarterback, he's going to be the best receiver in this class when we look back on it. So I apologize to Alan Lazard, Simi Cobbs Jr., Deontay Burnett, and Cortland Sutton. You guys did not crack the first round, but you guys are the next four receivers, next four players off the board on the draft game. And Lazard, I have him at 33 going to the Chicago Bears where Trubisky finally gets a legitimate weapon that can solidify the passing game. Lazard had the game-winning touchdown over Oklahoma, and he is very good. I, I don't know if you've studied him enough, but he's good. Simi Cobbs Jr. out of Indiana is 6'4", 220. He had a big game versus Ohio State, and he really solidified himself as one of the premier targets in this class. So Simi Cobbs Jr. out of Indiana goes to the New York Giants at 34. I don't think the Giants would take Sutton because they want a receiver that's fundamentally sound. They're big on that. They're big on fundamentally sound receivers. And I think that's the guy they're looking at when they're looking at Simi Cobbs Jr., Burnett, and Sutton. The guy who drops the least amount of passes and is the most fundamentally sound from a route running standpoint is Simi Cobbs Jr. That's why I think the Giants would take him. And then I gave the 49ers Deontay Burnett to pair up with Sam Darnold. The two, are reu two USC quarterback receivers reunited in San Francisco. Burnett's had more big games versus quality competition than Cortland Sutton has, and I value that a lot. And now at 36, we have the Browns taking Cortland Sutton. I have nine receivers ahead of Sutton, and if you count Anthony Johnson on a Buffalo, who's going to move ahead of Sutton? That's 10 receivers who are ahead of Cortland Sutton. And... I hate to do this to Cortland, but the competition at receiver this year is just so intense. It literally rivals the 2014 class at wide receiver with all the competition we have with these wide receivers. So, But your Browns get him, and with Saquon Barkley and Cortland Sutton, Kaiser better turn things around. Otherwise, he's not the guy. It's pretty straightforward. If the Browns are able to get Cortland Sutton and Saquon Barkley in the first and second round, and Kaiser still can't turn things around, That that's a very clear indicator he's not the guy, Joey. Yeah, Kaiser has, uh, Kaiser's big issue is his accuracy. <laughs> and the big issue for that, I've seen sometimes he puts his front foot out too far, sometimes he puts his foot a little bit behind the receiver, and so that's something he really has to work on heavy because he, well, his footwork has improved as far as how wide his step is. His footwork still has a long way to go as to where he needs to place his foot in the as far as the direction of the receiver goes because that foot makes all the difference. I mean, you can argue Sutton's a first-round receiver based on his size, but his catch radius is the big issue uh, with him. And he, he needs to do a better job. He can't spread his hands as far out when he's catching the football. That's the big issue with Cortland Sutton. And he's going to have until the combine to fix that. Because the gauntlet drill, if he's dropping passes in the gauntlet drill, you're going to be able to tell by how far he spreads his hands out. That's something we got to do a better job paying attention to at the combine when it comes to um, receivers is how, how far do they spread their hands out when catching the passes in the gauntlet drill. That's something we never really take a look at because we're just focused on the receiver trying to catch everything. But how they catch, it matters. So I, I have Cortland Sutton in round two because of that. But I know a lot of people in the draft community, including Ryan, have him in round one. There's even some people in the draft community that still have him as their number one receiver. But he had a terrible game versus TCU. He bounced back versus Connecticut, but Anthony Miller did much better against Connecticut than he did. So I, I can't sit here and say he's wide receiver one. I can't. Yeah, I, I can't either. He actually bounced back from a back in the press, and he has a physical stat. I think he just needs to be able to get in the NFL and get paid, and then you'll see him really shine. He and will not shine. money makes people shine. He will not shine unless he goes to a team with a Hall of Fame quarterback. If he goes to a team like the Saints, the Packers, or the Patriots, he will thrive. If he goes to anywhere else, he will falter. Mm, I think he'll thrive, but then I think once his you know, rookie contract gets up and he's able to find free agency, then he'll really shine even more. 
All right, number 37, Will Clapp out of LSU. This guy's the top center in the draft, and I think he's the only center with a shot at making the Pro Bowl. He just has a really good tape. So, I mean, Will Clapp comes in at 37. The Jets get him. Number 38, Jair Alexander out of Louisville. This was the top cornerback back in the preseason. He missed six games with an injury. That's why he's dropped this far. He's back now at full health, but with Minka in this class, with Holt, with Holton Hill do, doing good, this guy becomes cornerback three. And in this draft, there's not as big of a market for a cornerback as there was in last year's draft. So, I mean, this guy could fall to the second round. He could still go in the late first. But right now, I'm sort of on the fence with him. Number 39, Tarvaris McFadden. Another cornerback. So we had the Browns take. We had the Jair Alexander going to the um, Dolphins. We have Tarvaris McFadden going to the Chargers. Jason Verrett's injuries are starting to become a liability. And now we have Isaiah Oliver out of Colorado, 6'1, 195, going to the Browns at 40. I honestly believe Oliver can jump both McFadden and Alexander if he keeps playing at yeah. a high level because he has all yeah, of those tools. Yeah, sorry, Chris. Uh, Go ahead, Joey. Yeah, this was a guy that uh, we were talking about the other day, and I really think Oliver is one of the most talented players at his position in this draft, but he needs to stay healthy, no more of these little injuries, and he needs to show that he can do this on a big stage. But as far as pure raw talent goes, I think he's probably one of the most, if not the most, talented corner in the draft. That's a very good point, Joey. Um, number 41, we have um, Equinemius St. Brown. St. Brown is still considered a first-round receiver by some, but he's not shown the same speed and athleticism and technique that you'd like to see. Well, he's shown that. He just hasn't had the big games on tape yet, so... He, he misses the cut. Like Cortland Sutton, he misses the cut. And Christian Kirk is getting touchdowns consistently. And he's doing it against quality competition, which I value a lot. Number 42, we're going back to Alabama. Deron Payne. Now, people I've talked to are saying this guy is going to move into the first round. I have a second round grade on him at the moment because he hasn't really wowed me on tape. But Alabama is using him as a three-down defensive lineman. So if he's being used that way and he dominates the combine and people are saying he's going to have a Don Terry Poe-like impact at the combine, if that's the case, he will move into the first round. I have him in the early second round at the moment, but I do believe the talent is there for him to ultimately move into the first round. Any thoughts on Deron Payne, Kerm? Easily first-round talent. But the like I said before, Okay, so when what kind of scheme do you think fits him better? I honestly feel like a 43 scheme would fit him better, but I've seen people mock him to the Broncos. I know Josiah posted his mock on the site a few weeks ago and he had Jerron Payne to the Broncos. I'm not sure how you feel about that, Ryan, but that's what... We've, you know, uh, Chris. At this point, I think the Broncos need to just kind of start getting more depth at the key positions, just in case somebody goes down. Like right now, I feel like the Broncos would be tied with the Chiefs if we would have had Shane Ray in the beginning of the season. And then the same thing with like Derek Wolfe and his injury there for a little bit too. Is just like these factors kind of hurt our chemistry and everything. So that's a really nice fit. Yeah, and Deron Payne would come in and he would replace um, Domana Pico at nose tackle if they got him. You think a 43-year-old serves him the best too, Kerm? Yeah. I agree with that entirely. Moving on, um, I do have Deron Payne going to... Um, I think I have Deron Payne going to Buffalo. Because, yeah, I gave St. Brown to Arizona. I gave Deron Payne to... Um, Buffalo, because Kyle Williams, the defensive tackle next to Darius, is a free agent after this year. So I have Deron Payne on Buffalo. And I'm looking at Detroit as the only team that need, that could draft a 4-3 defensive tackle in the first round. 
That's the problem. It's like there's a lot of first round talents at defensive tackle this year, but the only team that's really strongly considering a defensive lineman in the first round is Detroit and maybe New Orleans. Those are the only 43 teams that will consider a defensive tackle, and that sort of limits the market for a defensive tackle in this class. Wouldn't you think, Joey, with all the quarterbacks and the other positions, wide receiver, secondary, the defensive tackles sort of get watered out? Yeah, I mean, this is... I think we saw the same type of draft a few years ago where it was extremely deep at a lot of positions, but it wasn't top-heavy. And I think, as you said, it's a lot the same way in this class. It's extremely deep, but you're not getting a lot of top five, top ten talent in it. And I think the offensive tackles, in a lot of ways, because I've seen when I was doing my first mock, that I wanted to put them higher, but there just wasn't a place for them at their talent level. They, so I think, yeah, a lot of in a lot of ways, based on the talent at a lot of other positions. Yeah, they, they kind of get weighted out a little bit. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I think there's at least three or four 43 defensive tackles with first-round tape, but with all the other quality players at skill positions, I'm only looking at two teams, the Lions and maybe the Saints, as the teams that take that would take this guy in the first round. Maybe Buffalo will, will take a defensive lineman because – They've invested a lot in their secondary. They they paid both of the safeties they got in free agency four year deals. So maybe they maybe they would go with a safety. It's hard to say. Um, yeah, I think the three big positions where you're really going to have a lot of guys push down: offensive tackle, defensive tackle, and cornerback are they're going to have a lot of guys push down. I think. I think they, you can make the same with the argument as talent. well. I think you can make yeah. the same with inside linebacker because you got Rashawn Evans, but you also got two other three down linebackers, the guy out of Georgia, and you've got another guy who we'll get to in a second here. But there's, but you're looking at guys like Cameron R- Smith and Malik Jefferson who just haven't impressed on tape this year while other guys are showing that three down ability. And that's what, teams are going to look at. It's a deep linebacker class, but guys are going to get pushed down outside of Evans to round two. But moving on to number 43, yeah. the Bengals, Jordan Whitehead out of Pittsburgh. He got a three-game suspension for a DUI at the beginning of the year. He has 4-4 speed, and he'd be a first-rounder if he didn't miss those games. But the Bengals don't really care about character issues. So they take Jordan Whitehead here. Number 44, we get to my linebacker two, Tremaine Edmonds out of Virginia Tech. This guy still needs to do a better job at winning blocks, but as far as having the versatility to play every position at linebacker, that's there. He can play outside linebacker on either side or inside linebacker, and he's a three-down player. Scouts believe he's going to run a 4-5-40 at the combine. He's going to test really well, and that testing could push him into the first round with Evans. So I don't think he's as athletic as Evans, but I do think he could get pushed up the boards it depends. I mean, I think there's only a few. Dane Brugler said that Edmonds, Evans, and the Georgia linebacker, who didn't make my top 50 but the second round of my mock, are the only three-down players. Cameron Smith does not have the foot speed to be a three-down player, even though he's great in coverage and can make interceptions and his instincts are tremendous. And Malik Jefferson, while he has the speed and athleticism you want, he doesn't have the instincts to be a 100-tackler type of linebacker, and that's the deal-breaker with Malik Jefferson. So... Uh, number 45, we'll go back to linebacker here. This is a pure outside linebacker, Jerome Baker out of Ohio State. is projected to run a 4 3 7 40 time, but he's a 43 outside linebacker only. And again, I don't think there's a market for 43 outside linebackers in the first round with all the talent that's in this draft. It's, it's like this guy's a first. this guy might be a first-round talent, but I don't think there's a team that's desperate enough to take a 43 outside linebacker in the first round this year when you consider all the positions that this class is deep at. It's deep at quarterback. It's deep at offensive tackle. It's deep at edge rusher. It's deep at corner. It's deep at receiver. So I think he gets weeded out like a lot of these other players. It is what it is, Joey, unfortunately. But I have the Lions taking Baker at 45. Yeah, uh... The Lions are a team, 
I don't think need many positions to. Yeah, the Lions are pretty good offensively. Their corners are under contract. Yeah. They running backs are under contract. They got to get guys who are going because they're losing a lot of front seven players to free agency, including Ziggy Ansa. They never got a defensive end to pair with Ansa, so that's two DENs. You need a defensive tackle to replace Floody Nada, who's missed some games with injuries, and you need a right outside linebacker to replace Tahir Whitehead because Whitehead was great at middle linebacker last year. He had over 100 tackles, but the Lions still drafted Gerard Davis, and they moved uh, Whitehead over to the weak side. So if Whitehead does not step up, you're going to be looking at another linebacker, and Jerome Baker just seems like the, the best candidate. Um, November 46 with the Rams pick. The Buffalo Bills, they get Ty Johnson out of Maryland. LaShawn McCoy turns 30 this year, and they can save a ton of cap space if they release LaShawn McCoy. And LaShawn McCoy does not have a rushing touchdown yet, so I'm telling you, LaShawn McCoy may be on the chopping block. I know it sounds too premature, too early to say, but LaShawn McCoy may be on the chopping block. This might be his last season in Buffalo. Yeah, and but something you have to realize about that is that McCoy right now, he might be on the chopping block, he might not have the stats to bag it, but he is still a legitimate threat to the team's playing around. If you notice, the biggest games with Tyrod Taylor are games where Floyd is heavily influenced in the offense. He might not produce well, but teams will game plan around that. And right now, that is his biggest asset as a player, is that teams will, as long as teams game plan around him as a threat, that's what is going to help. So, he has that, but that doesn't last very long. I'm not sure about round two running backs right now. Um, Ty Smith, a guy Mark told me about, is a possible first rounder, and he had 1,000 rushing yards last year. That's why I have Ty Smith at 46 to Buffalo. And number 47, the Vikings get a weapon to pair up with Mason Rudolph. They get Michael Gallup out of Colorado State, who has just been phenomenal this year. He's second in the country in receiving yards. He had 81 receiving yards on Minka Fitzpatrick. That's impressive. So I think Michael Gallup goes to the Vikings here in the second round. Number 48, your Denver Broncos. They pass on Malik Jefferson, but they get a much better player who helps that defensive line after going with a right tackle and Archie Lewis in round one, they get a defensive tackle to replace Pico. Vita Villa out of Washington. Vita Villa has just been phenomenal. He scouts, coaches are saying this is a three-down player. Even at 350 pounds, he's showing three-down ability. And it's like, this guy's 350 pounds. He can play nose tackle. And he's a three-down player, he might even move up into the first round. I know Tony Mario is the Titans taking this guy in with their first-round pick. So that tells you how talented Vita Villa is because he's a three-down player. And when you're looking at defensive linemen, you've got to weed out the three-down players from the guys who are not three-down players. And Vita Villa, despite being 350 pounds, is a three-down player. So that helps his stock. Number 49... Um, I 49ers, they pick at 49 with the Saints pick. They go Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb leads the SEC in rushing yards right now. He's a great blocker on tape. Hasn't gotten injured yet. So Nick Chubb out of Georgia to the 49ers. And yeah, Chubb has rebounded extremely well from a very slow start this year. So I'm hoping that he can keep that up because what sets him apart is his blocking ability, and if he can regain that speed and looseness he had before his injury, then with that blocking ability, anybody who gets him in the second round will get a steal. Yep, and number 50, Josh Allen out of Wyoming. Now, I have the Jaguars taking Josh Allen as a project quarterback behind Bortles, but I have him taking him here at 50 because he's the best QB on the board in the second round. Jake Al, Josh, Jake Browning, disappointing outing versus Arizona State. Um, Luke Falk, disappointing outing versus Cal. And Josh Allen may go earlier than this now. There's a reason why certain people in the draft community, whether it be Matt Miller, Jeremiah, Charlie Campbell, still have this guy in their top ten. And Tony Mario told us the other day that 
if Josh Allen gets a senior bowl invite, he is going to Mobile, and he's going to play in the game. He, he wants to be remembered as a quarterback that is one of the best players in the draft. He doesn't want to go down as a guy like Connor Cook, who just blew it. So, and he's upset about the fact that his team didn't start off well. And he's not going to throw teammates under the bus. He's going to remain calm and humble. But he's upset that those bad games against Power 5 teams have take a little bit of a hit on his stock, so he wants to go to Mobile if he gets the invite because he's getting his degree in December. Even though he's a junior redshirt, he will have his college degree in December, and if he goes to the Senior Bowl and he has a Carson Wentz type of impact week there, he's going to go... He's, he's probably... Might, his stock might not even be affected at all. That's the scary thing. If he has a Carson Wentz type week in Mobile, his stock will not be affected despite the early bad games on tape. So... That's really the big thing you have to look at here with uh, Josh Allen. Yeah, Josh Allen is... I think Josh Allen and Paul is running down with Nate Peterman from last year. He's a guy who could potentially be the best pocket passer in this class. But at the same time, he has a few issues. Uh, he's going to be pro-ready. He's going to be ready to step in. But he's going to have to take a little bit of work, get some of his mannerisms together, get used to the pro game. And then after that, we're going to see where it goes. But like Peterman, I think he could end up being a steal at some point in the second round, especially if he doesn't have to play in the first, first season. I agree. Great stuff. That was our top 50. I'm going to go, be right back with the computer charger, and then we will wrap this show up with our week six predictions from Joey and Kerm. Ryan and I broke this down on Friday's show, but we'll be back with that after I get my charger. And this is that's the end of the YouTube stream. We'll still be on TalkShoe, though, and I'll have a link for the full episode on TalkShoe below in the YouTube video when I upload it later today.